Hey, hey, hey. What's up, everybody? It's Wednesday. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Girl Chat Sports now. Mo and Mal. How is everybody doing? How is the week going? Man, um, it's another Wednesday, and here we are, right? <laughs> you not going to talk at all? <laughs> okay. This is going to be a girl. This is going to be a girl power event we've got going on. I mean, you do the intro. I'm waiting for you to do whatever you got to say. All right, here but you. Okay. welcome everybody on this Wednesday vibe. You know, we're going on a Wednesday night. You know, we're going to celebrate this girl power. We're going to keep it going from the month of March. You know, girl power is not just a month. We celebrate it all year round. And tonight is just such one of these epic episodes that I can't wait to get our guest on. This is truly, truly exciting and quite the coup for Girl Chat Sports because we've never had a WNBA legend as our guest or yes. MVP or yes. an assistant WNBA coach or a college coach, high school. A coach. WNBA never, champion. Champion. I mean, we, never, we have not had any of this. So I, I everybody buckle up your seatbelts, join the chat. Any questions that you have, please, please, without further ado, go ahead and ask those uh, when our guest comes on. I mean, I'm just elated. Like this is, this is big. And if you're wrote, watching, and yeah, and if you're watching, make sure you you share this with your friends. Let them in on it. We're going to be monitoring the chat. We're going to be putting the people in there that have questions. Just know that you're what you see is about five seconds delayed from what we do. So right. our questions may go back and forth, but we definitely want you to be in this discussion with us um, and to talk about it. Before we go any farther, I just want to say, say thank you to our sponsor for this for this month. We've got One Hope Wine. Sabernia Moore, I appreciate you. A little sip of more. Um, you can find her at www.onehopewine.com slash my shop slash Siberia dash more. Go shop with her. Here you guys go. I mean, I will say this. You know, I don't be what drinking. What did you get? What kind of wine did you get? Well, the so only you. wine I drink, Moscato. It's the only wine I drink. Okay. So I have a cab. Usually good for, you know, fall season. Cheers to the show. But cheers to the show. Cheers to our guests. Cheers Salud. to our guests. Salute. Krista, let's just get her on so we can get you this. You didn't even drink. Up. That's bad luck. You got to oh. sip. Okay, one more time Salud. then. Let's do this Salud. one more time. Salud. Take a drink. It's good too. There you go. It's very good. Very refreshing. Shout out to it One is. Hope Wine. Um, yes. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for this lovely gift. And we will dedicate our Wednesdays now to Wine Wednesdays. Hey, okay. Wine Wednesdays right here. Yeah, let's not? go. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the show, our girl, our <laughs> new friend, the Crystal. person we have fallen in love with and after this yes. book, Crystal Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. I'm just sitting here in the green room, dying, laughing, watching you guys. So I'm really excited about this conversation. <laughs> well, we're excited to have you on and we have so much to talk about with you. And we're going to dedicate this whole hour to you. Um, I mean, like really, I said, it, it, it's, it's a girl power moment. And I think it's just the epitome of girl power and perseverance and adversity and all of those things. Appreciate um, it, ladies. So you're just amazing. I'm not really good at taking so. compliments, but I appreciate that. <laughs> We're going to keep dishing them throughout the entire show. Yes, we are. Yes, just we are. be ready and just take it. So first, I just want to show off what we got here. This is the cover of your book that's coming out, Finding Myself. It is amazing. I mean, I, I feel blessed that we were able to get kind of like a, a secret, like, you know, hey, check the book out kind of thing, because I'm loving it. I'm going to order anyways, because first of all, whoever did your picture and the, and the cover of it is amazing. It just. Oh, it was fire. I love the whole concept of the cover. It's like <laughs> um, the whole scheme of it and the, the, the dark and the black and all of that, and the fade to that, as well as the uh, bold print of what the title is and everything. It just, it, it's one of those book covers that makes you pick it up and want to open it up and read it. It's a very inviting cover, even though it's like, cause, cause it kind of comes off like, oh, she got some stuff to tell. She <laughs> yeah. has some stories. Yeah. And so we're just gonna tap on in and see what these stories are about. <laughs> and so I, hey, like I said, I'm a fan right now. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm gushing, I'm turning to a fan girl right now with you, Crystal. But let's start with, um, how you decided to write this book and where you're from originally. Let's okay. let's get into that. Well, I'm from Atoka, Oklahoma, uh, right in the dead center of the Bible Belt. And uh, I actually didn't set out to write a book. I didn't think, oh, I'm so philosophical and smart that I'm going to write a book. I actually started writing, journaling, just journaling my feelings because I felt so bad inside at the time. I just wanted it to be out of me. And by the time I was done and I had 
six or seven books full, I decided to, what am I going to do with this now? And then I, I sent it to a beat writer that wrote for us in New York. Her name's Lois Elfman. And I had her, can you review this material and tell me if you think it's book worthy? And I, she read it and sent it back. And then she emailed me back and said, great content, very disorganized. Like it's not a book. So <laughs> I've, I wrote it 15 years ago and then I just set out and organizing it and then getting help here and there from people and friends. So that's how I ended up writing it. Wow. And the thing of it is, is I know there is more to the story, but you hit on so many different things, uh, starting with your upbringing and upbringing and the competitive nature that you had developed from your parents that you didn't even know really subconsciously because of the lifestyle that they had with um, their alcohol abuse. And um, some of that, as far as speaking to you said your relationship with dad, he would always Com not compliment you on high performing games, always tell you what you missed and you didn't take it as, you know, hey, where's the love for the things I have done. But now this is what he's trying to do is motivate me to fix those things and focus on the things I did wrong. So I thought well, that was very interesting in that father daughter kind of dynamic. Yeah. Well, that was mostly hindsight. I'm going to tell you when I was in the in the middle of all that, all I wanted to do is make him say he was proud of me. I didn't know that behind my back to all his friends, he was gushing about me and he constantly bragged about me to his, to people. But to me, he never allowed me to be satisfied with my best. And he almost trained me to think about not focus on the end results, but focus on what I could do better to be better the next time. So when you're growing through that as a young child, growing up, being kind of advanced at what you do, you don't understand that. It wasn't until I was older that I really realized how lucky I was that he actually done that for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, wow. incredible. Well, what I thought was interesting, I mean, you know, growing up in that in the rural town of Oklahoma, which by the way, we have a girl here repping Atoka with you, Tanya Miller. She's like, that's my hometown girl. So we just want to yeah. acknowledge yeah. her for being in this chat <laughs> as well. Um, one thing I, I, I guess what, what, you know, we'll get into details of the book, but what is it that made you really want to make a memoir, write a book and to share your story? Cause it wasn't just like, some regular or old story, like where there's multiple levels, like every chapter was like opening up a new segment mm -hmm. and a new, you know, it, it really was a chapter of your life and the struggles, the battles, the, the ups, the downs, like what is it that made you feel like now it's time for us to, to, to now it's time for me to really open up and, and kind of give my story. Well, I, I really wrote that book to make people think like, and to, to sit back and think about their lives. We all go through struggles. We all have ups and downs. And I just think, as a society, we are programmed to focus on all of the negative things that happen to us. And I've just taken a different approach. I try to cling to the, the positive things, no matter how big or how small. And I don't care what kind of situation I am. I try hard to find the best things in that situation and not focus on the negative things. So I think for me, writing this book and, and telling my story is just to give other people the strength to tell their stories and to be proud of the stories and understand that all the things that you went through, all the things that happened are what make you who you are. And mm -hmm. I love who I've become. So you can't hate the things that trained you to be who you are or right. make you who you are. So I wrote the book honestly to, to, so other people would think, you know, Oh, she's a professional athlete. She made it to this far, but I had to overcome a lot to get here. Most people stop before they get to that, to that finish line. And you already had a competitive drive within you, I feel like, as a child, because you were playing baseball with boys. Yeah. And I mean, you were playing high intensity fastball baseball with guys. Like, it wasn't a softball league. This was young boys out there throwing curveballs, <laughs> having intimidation factors, being on a team like that. And I just never thought, for a WNBA standpoint, that you were all basketball. You have an affinity love for baseball, too. Now, well, what... Go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to say it's really funny know. that you say that because I don't know if five or six years ago was a big deal about the young girl who made the made the uh, the the World Series of the little kids leave. Yes. Mm -hmm. I did yes. that in the I, I was doing that in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> Just was no Internet to tell anybody about right, it. I sure. started on second base on my high school baseball team, led my team in slugging percentage all the way till I was a senior in high school. So, and then I went on to college 
and played tennis in college. Number one doubles, number two wow. singles. So and there was a family that introduced you to that, Morris. Right? Yeah, there's that, a yeah. family that in introduced me to that. But yeah, baseball is something that I would have been probably would have been my sport had I been I could hit the ball anywhere. I just didn't have the power for it, but loved it. The uh the solidarity of it. Even though it's a team sport, you have to the solidarity of of being in the outfield and when the balls hit at you 60 miles an hour, no one's gonna help you catch that ball or dig it out the dirt. Mm -hmm. So those yeah. are the things, the challenge of it is that I fell in love with in baseball. Yeah. What I thought was phenomenal too, is that you mentioned you being a place hitter. Not too many people, even in the pros, can even say that they're place hitters. Like that is mm -hmm. a that is a skill set that takes a lot of practice and just natural talent to be able to hit a ball in a certain place so that you know you're making the play for your team. I thought that was just like I'm just hoping to swing and hit the ball, let alone being able to <laughs> aim it into a certain. It is, and like Goose mentioned here, uh, shout out to Goose, let the ball bounce. Um, it's a lost art. It, it really is a lost is art. A lost art. You don't it see is. that as much. And, you know, I've been doing some commentating for this wiffle ball league and they've always mentioned, <laughs> they always mention this place hitting. And I'm like, man, I never see anybody can just place it somewhere. So it's really incredible. That was one of the things I was like, dang, I mean, among thousands of things within the book that I was taking notes on, I was like, I got to mention that place hitting because that was just phenomenal. But what is it? Did you think it was, were you getting recruited? I mean, I guess you can't really get recruited for baseball back in the eighties um, for college because and did they even have softball in college back yeah, then? Uh, yeah, they didn't have softball. I actually got into baseball. I come from a long line of professional baseball players. UL Washington, who won uh, the World Series with the Kansas City Royals in the 80s. My cousin lives in my hometown. He played with a toothpick in his wow. mouth. And then he won four with the Red Sox as a hitting instructor. So okay. my, t my family competed in co-ed softball tournaments. As a seventh grader, I was playing the third base line in these co-ed softball games with grown men. So um, I just something that my family did together. We didn't have a lot of money and the things we did together were go to the lake, camping, play softball. Those are the things that we did as a family because they didn't cost them much and everybody right. got to participate. So I, I just grew up playing softball and didn't like softball because it was so slow. I wanted to mm. steal bases and I wanted to throw the <laughs> ball hard and I was better than all the guys and the baseball coach just asked me to come out. So. Yeah. And wow. I'm a baseball girl. I admire the game of baseball. I always said if I had children, they were going to be into the baseball because that <laughs> to me, and we've lost a lot of minorities in the league of baseball. We don't see too many um, black children playing uh, baseball like we used to. Um, there are still a few inner city leagues, but when it comes to the majors, we, we, we've lost that. And a lot of it has gone to either basketball or football as a focus. And yeah. I, you saying what you're saying is a great proponent for people to get their kids active in a game that anybody could play to a certain degree. I mean, you could throw, you could catch, you could do, and just have fun with it. And you never know what kind of hidden skills or talents come from that um, with doing it. I remember just playing catch in the yard with my parents and my dad. And I used to throw some heaters. My dad was like, God, you could throw a fastball, but never <laughs> thought of it. As something that I'm going to stat pursue. check that with Mr. Three. Stat check, stat check. He's not on our live right now, but check, stat check it. I, I promise you. I promise you. I was throwing on that glove for sure. And I could catch pretty well too. But okay. just that alone, you just never know what um, other options in sports that you have. You know, it's not just the one dimensional of going to basketball or football where it's more culturally accepted. It's also culturally accepted in baseball too. So that, I just thought yeah. that was amazing from your standpoint. I also thought it was amazing too that you hunt. Yeah. That you were uh, into the wild. And you like call the wild. I'm not even going to say that. You were one of those kids <laughs> that could hunt anything and giving tips on fishing and hunting venison. And I like deer, by the way. I'm sorry for my vegans out there, but venison tastes good to me. So I, I come yeah. from that with my dad's roots. But the fact that you were able to do all of those things and Still, to me, that represents a childhood that a lot of people don't get to have, even as what you were describing in the book, the things that occurred within your childhood, um, you still kind of had a sense of one. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'm so thankful. Like One of the things I hope people don't read my book and feel sorry for me, that book is a story of hope, is a book of a story of overcoming. And I think that growing up, living off the land, I think it's really hard to be the person 
when a person can vox can survive at all levels. Like mm -hmm. I can, I'm very happy if I have to live off the land or I'm very happy if I can go to McDonald's, I'm not happy if I have to eat caviar or some rich people food. I do not like that stuff. I don't, but I'm happy in just about any state. So I, I feel uh, real proud of my upbringing. And, and I say this to people all the time. I was country before Blake Shelton made it cool. So me and my, me and my friends, I still have the same friends that I had. Uh, I, I still sp I speak to two people that I have real friendship with from the WNBA. We go fishing. We have fishing tournaments. I'm, when I'm in Oklahoma, I still kind of hang out with the same people that I did when I was in the first and second grade. Very nice. Look, look some fellow, some Marvin fellow. Too. Yeah, some that's my guy. Out here. Yeah. Deer <laughs> and Marvin. mooses are the best. Um, yes, some they people are. commenting and writing moose, and how is that compared to deer? It, it, it talks I've never I've eaten never moose. moose before, but that venison goes moose. hard. It has I don't a eat deer either. Yeah. That deer is on the point but for sure. I did when I had to live off the land. I ate deer. Now I don't do deer. I can't no. mess with Bambi like that. No. It's, yeah. Uh -uh. This time, yeah. I know. Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> in the state of Nevada, you can't hunt Bambi. You can do no. the, you can do the bucks, but not the does. And now the does have gotten slick by coming out in front of the bucks <laughs> to protect them. At least that's where my dad's hunting experience. Well, to I'm gonna have to Marcus get you to Oklahoma more. <laughs> right? I'm gonna get my dad. Like we're gonna have to do this. Because, Bring your yeah. dad. <laughs> Look, let me get my shotgun ready. Let's right. go. <laughs> right. And then even with you with the crawdads, I'm a big crawfish girl. I can't eat crawfish here. Let's be clear. Has to be in Louisiana. Has to be in the South. I have to twist the tail off, suck the head, all of that good stuff. Oh. Um, mm -mm. There's nothing like it. I, I can't do it locally here, but I could definitely do it. Do it uh, in Louisiana. In Louisiana. <laughs> so when you have referenced that with the crawdads and the frying and the whole big fire situation that you guys <laughs> laugh about now, Look, I was like, that would have been me because I know me, if I had lived down there, it would have been crawfish. Some kind of death, it's something that you have to eat at home because it's so messy. Like you can't it really is. get down through there and eat it like you want to eat it in public. So I right. do that at family functions only. So. Mm. And also I wanted to touch on. Well, too, I eat a lot of crab crawfish. and I'll eat it anywhere. I don't care. Yeah, crab is good. I'm, I'm with you on that. the crab. The crawfish. Is, crab. It's a lot of work for a little bit of meat. It I'll is take a lot crab of crab anyway. It is. It is, but I can do it. I can only do it down south. Like the seasoning here just doesn't work for me, sadly. But yeah. And then you guys, you traveled internationally. When you played internationally, the fact that you wanted to be in the inclusion of the cities that you were in by learning their language and being respectful to that, because, you know, a lot of Americans will travel overseas and they're like, no, you need to learn English. Like I need to. I shouldn't have to I shouldn't have to have this translator to communicate with you in France or in Italy or in this, and it's like really that's how you think like yeah. be respectful for that and I love that you touched on that and how you uh, were at the Italian restaurant and the owner knew English but forced you into ordering an Italian and when you got fluent in your Italian speaking he was like I knew you could do it and you were like wait a minute you spoke English this whole time you did this yes that was <laughs> such a, a funny <laughs> lesson that he taught me but um, he spoke English the whole time and he let me mess up orders. He recooked me. Next year I got away, I'd done away with my translator and had a, a teammate that was going to college for English. So since I had a Spanish background, I was just learning how to learning words at that point and learning. Right. So I taught her a little bit. She taught me a little bit. And by the end of the year, I was fluent and I stayed there for four years. That's how much I loved Italy. But Touching on what you're saying, um, I learned early in life that you catch more flies with honey. So when I, ev almost every country I went into, uh, I learned hard, to, I tried hard to become a part of their culture and learn to do things the way they did because then they helped me. When I really needed help or I needed someone to go to the grocery store, a quick story, I was in Korea and at the end of every practice, the girls had to put towels in the end and they had to push them with their hands all the way down to the other end. And that's how they clean the floor. The, the, the wow. Korean girls had to do it. The Chinese wow. girl, I mean, the Americans mm. didn't. Mm. So when they started doing it, I got down there with them. That's like, no, 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 you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. And I'm like, well, we're teammates. If y'all have to do it, I have to do it. Yeah. So I did it Facts. all year long. They respected me so much more for it. And next, the next year they tried to resign me. And at the end of the year, I was like, I'm not coming back. If I have to clean the floors with the girls, that's unfair. <laughs> And no one had their white floors the next year. But oh, it's because you. I made yeah. myself a part of them that they would do anything for me. And I learned that early in life. So, And touching on what, since we're talking about your experience overseas, um, one thing you brought up in the book was that 
Well, first I wanted to get your take on how you say athletes don't see race. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the second portion of that would be racism differentials between here in the States versus what you experienced out in Europe and other countries. Yes. Well, um, I say athletes don't see race. I mean, there's good and bad in everybody, but for the most part, most athletes see a competitor. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're black, white, orange, purple, if you are a true champion, a true competitor that who wants to prove how good you are, you don't care what color that person is. I just want to climb the mountaintop. I'm gonna climb it. I don't care what color you are. Yeah. Um, racism in America t- is more so they look down on you because of your color. When you're in Europe, uh, I was in Moldova for two weeks. I probably was the only black person within a thousand miles probably. Yeah. They looked at me out of curiosity, like because they didn't know me. They didn't see black people often, but it wasn't with a hatred or I don't like you because you're of your skin color. It was because mm-hmm. I want to know more about you. I'm curious. I haven't seen many people like you. And that's a whole different feeling. So, yeah, yeah, it has to be. And I and I also think even with here being in the climate that we're in with everything that's been going on, especially from last year, um, what has change for you as far as the outlook and hope of America and youth sports and in college levels and stuff as far as race in America. A lot of these college kids are now choosing HBCUs as opposed to going into the NCAA or Big One or Pac-12 divisional schools. What's your take as far as um, now the switch is kind of turning on where Black athletes are now speaking out, having an option to speak out and being protected within that culture, if you will, of sports? Well, um, I think that it, th- this is how you, we're going to affect change in sports, to be able to speak out now and it not be held against you, especially in female sports. Um, when I first came into the WNBA, I don't care what your sexuality was. You tried to keep it under wraps. Now the girls in the WNBA are very outspoken about yeah. who they are. It wasn't like that when I came into the league at all, not even a little bit. So um, just uh, getting on board with that and 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 – understanding that the change is going to come. Are we going to spearhead it? Or are we going to, how, how is it going to come? And for me, I want to be a part of the change a part of the positive part of the change, not a part of the problem. And I'm only going to touch on it a little bit because I, I, I'm under, I can't really speak about it a little bit, but you ask me about racism. Mm-hmm. I live in a small town of 4,000 people about in December, I was stopped. They didn't know who I was. Uh, my license was suspended because I got a ticket before I went into the bubble. I come out the bubble, didn't pay the ticket. I was like two months or a month afterwards. I'm in my hometown. White cop stops me. Right, out. He stops me because my headlights are on bright in the middle of Christmas in a lit up downtown. So I know what it is from jump. To make a long story short, I was charged with a felony of, of, of smuggling THC into a penal institution. I just, I had just left a meeting from a man asking me to use my name, gave me a piece of product. I have a cannabis card, so I'm not illegal. Mm -hmm. Gave me a product that he wanted me to put my name on. I left that meeting and told him no, because I was in thought leadership speaking. That's not what I want my legacy to be, yada, yada, yada. I had this in my pocket. When he decides to take me to jail, very few people go to jail for a suspended license. It's up to the cop. When he takes me to jail, they never pat me down. They never read me my rights. They never do any of that. So they bring me in. They tell me to take the stuff out of my pockets. I do that. And boom, they they add a felony charge of smuggling THC into wow. a penal institution, which oh I never goodness. did. Wow. Okay. The judge never charges me with that because it was a joke. But the police station released it to the paper because they knew I was about to talk about being racially profiled. So they released that to the Associated Press. My gene job, OU, University of Tulsa are open now, and I can't apply for it. I was never charged with this crime, but they released it to the press prior. Mm. So oh anyway, this, I still don't have problems. Like, still right. I want to be a part of the solution. Right. Right. Like, these things happen. People yeah, are people. We make mistakes. We do dumb things. And it's something, oh, I'm going to fight. My name is more important to me than any award, any amount of money, or anything that I've ever done. This book is my greatest accomplishment. 
-hmm. I will fight tooth and nail for my name. And that's what's about to happen. So I actually offered to, uh, to the mayor to uh, let's talk about this so we can clear this up and put it out there. So I'm covered. I didn't want to get into a lawsuit, but they didn't want to do that. So that's my spill on racism, wow. but I'm still not angry about it. Like I still yeah. want to be a part of the solution. There's a way to handle this to make it better. There's a way to handle this to antagonize the situation. Too yeah, many. Yeah, because you could have totally awesome. been uh, yeah. outraged. You could have gone. Yeah. And I was outraged area. for a while. Yes. I had to take time to calm down to be able to react from an emotionally intelligent place. Um, and I'm still going to get what I deserve out of the whole thing. I'm I'm hoping, but I uh, I've never been in trouble with the law. It's part. It's disheartening. They put it on the news oh my uh, God. here in Oklahoma. I've never been. It's, it's disheartening when parents walk up to me. I've been teacher of the year in my town, and they say it broke our kids' heart to see that. So it's just a lot of things that I have to fight for with that. Um, mm -hmm. But that's on the way. My book right now is my baby, and I don't right. want a lot of negative publicity around it. Yeah. Well, and what's so. crazy, this is the same small town that, would, like you had mentioned, we're at capacity at the gyms when you were playing your games. It's the same city and the same state that basically you still hold records for. You still have records at Southeastern. Uh, I'm Oklahoma. the only black female ever inducted into the Oklahoma Sports oh, well, Hall of yeah, Fame. Yeah. I broke barriers in the 90s. I'm standing in white people's homes that they had, would never have a black person mm -hmm. in their homes. That's what I'm fighting for. The, the, mm -hmm. the thing that I crossed racial boundaries in a time in this community. So to, to try to tarnish my reputation when I have never done anything but bring pride, not only to this town and to this state, it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing because I, I'm, anybody who knows me knows that basketball is probably the most secondary thing in my life. It's something that I've done, it's something I've been great at, but it's not who I am. I would rather people remember me. Uh, some of the things that people are posting on my Facebook page about how I affected that, that means way more to me than any trophy that I've ever gotten. Okay. So, yeah. And you oh. talked about that, your relationship with the car yeah. uh, dealership uh, man who had the mullet. I remember the yeah. mullet. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, your relationship with him, despite his peer group and the naysayers and things they would say about you and how you tried to quash a narrative because you learned early on that some responses aren't warranted from your mother when you had a fan come up to you who was a known person to drop in bombs left and right. Like it, it was just, you know, his thing. And for you to check him and then your mom saying, whoa, 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 you had an opportunity to quash any narratives or any misconceptions he had about black people. And you missed it on that mark. And I feel like from you getting that lesson told to you is why you are who you are today in saying what you're saying, because that kind of relegates to what your mother was telling you. And I think that's just awesome that it's, you're trying to quash those stereotypes. It's so true. My mom has always told us several sayings that'll always stick with me. One is two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, uh, learn so much from that. And I probably will always take that. I, I try to do the right. thing. It's not always easy to do the right thing, but try hard to. Uh, and two is uh, one time I whooped old Kane's ass till he could. Um, we weren't allowed to say I can as kids. You mm -hmm. find a way. Uh, you beat Kane up until you can. So those are two things that my mom taught us that I think will I'll teach to my kids. And I think probably kids that have played for me in basketball probably know those sayings because they're something that I really truly believe in. Wow. And I also have to admire you too on your spiritual fa foundation that you have in your life too and how you um, got involved with the church and that kind of um, openness of where you were in your time and your things that you were going through. I just thought that was amazing as well. Um, do you still feel spiritually connected with God and do you still... Um, you utilize them in your life or have that same type of relationship? Actually, I think that my relationship is better. I don't think that I'm a person that uh, I don't feel like I got to go to church every day to have mm -hmm. a relationship with God. And just quite honestly, from the time I was a little kid, I felt like I was put here for a reason, for something special. And I, I've I just finished reading this book. Uh, it's called The Cafe in the Middle of Nowhere. And it, the book's basically about this guy who goes into a cafe and there's three questions on the menu. Why are you here? Are you afraid of death? And I can't remember the third one, but the, it's about your journey. Once you ask the question, why are you here? And you start looking for your purpose in life, it becomes like a burning desire.
to find that purpose. And I think I asked that question at a young age. Why, why am I here? I know I'm here for a reason. I don't know what it is. Show me, show me, show me. Yeah. So I think that basketball has been everything for me. And I'm probably one of the few people who can say that I've played for a one a championship at every single level from grade school, high school, college, NAI, NCAA is the only place that I haven't had the opportunity uh, to do it. Uh, but I don't feel, I, I just feel like I'm very, very blessed to have a lot of the opportunities that I've had. Yeah. And it was all about your choices too, because you were at Louisiana Tech, you left Louisiana Tech and went to Southeastern Oklahoma um, state. And a lot of people were saying like, Hey, why didn't you go to these big 10 schools? Why didn't you go to PAC 12? Why didn't you do this divisions? Why didn't you go, uh, where most people were going? Cause you were being sought out by everybody. Yeah, yeah. you were, you were, you, <laughs> well, totally were. you were a hot commodity. And well, I'm driven by what were. makes me happy. That's, mm. that's my problem. And I, I, and I think that's probably why people have a hard time. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I march to the beat of my own drum and I try hard to do what's right. Um, uh, I, I might, I might, it might keep me from getting some jobs. I, I would probably say just because I'm very, uh, I'm going to do what's right. And I'm not a yes, man. That doesn't mean I'm combative. Just, I think that if I'm ever going to be highly successful, I don't want a bunch of people around me. That's just going to say, you're great. You're this, you're that. I want people around me. Who's going to make me think in a different way. And the way I, I say it, I like like-hearted people with completely different mindsets because our hearts are going to keep us going in the same direction, in the same path. But our minds, you're going to challenge me to learn more and to do more and to grow and to come outside my comfort zone. But lots of people, I live in black and white. I don't really play in the gray area. I'm mm -hmm. tell you the truth. And I don't. So <laughs> people have a hard time with people who are just straightforward. And I right. trust straightforward people because yeah. I don't have to guess as to what they feel. Right. Another thing I want to talk about just briefly before we get into more of the WNBA discussion and stuff is you um, kind of realizing that, you know, you weren't the same as every other rest of the girls back when you were like in the third grade, you know, being LGBTQ and realizing it at that age in a small town on the Bible Belt in Oklahoma, like <laughs> how, I, I, I can't even begin to understand, but how is it that you got through that? How, you know, where did you find solace during those times? Like, how did you get through, you know, getting getting to where you are now? Uh, Probably a little voice in my head. Like I really didn't have no one to go to for any guidance. I knew that I wasn't hiding it from anybody, not that I was trying to hide it from anybody, but no, it was like the elephant in the room. Everybody knew it, but nobody talked about it. Um, and uh, no one saw me with anybody, but uh, I didn't have very many discussions with anybody about it, mostly just the questions that I asked myself. And I tell you, I went through many, many, many suicidal moments. Mm -hmm. I have done everything from, well, I guess they need to read the book. Yes, they to do. find out some of that stuff. That. Yeah, but yeah. I've I've went through many moments to where I didn't like myself, and mostly mm -hmm. because of how I wanted other people to view me. And it wasn't until right. one day I just said, you know what? The people who don't like me don't have to be around me, and the people that do, the people that rock with me, then they can rock with me. And that's yeah. that's just kind of how I've lived my life. I've been fortunate to be somebody just real headstrong and didn't need. I can I'm fine by myself. I don't need a mm -hmm. lot of friends around me to be okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when do you feel like you were comfortable in your own skin? When, when did you have that? Like, like you could exhale and you just felt comfortable and you weren't having many of those hard thoughts about yourself anymore. I probably would. And this is going to be sad to say, I probably would say maybe four years ago, three or four years ago. Like I just really got to the point to where I was like, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying it was bothering me. I was walking around having anxiety like I was as a child, but now I'm to the point to where I just don't apologize about it. Like I don't mind having my girlfriend in public. I never posted my girlfriend on my account or talked about her in public. Shoot, very few people. I'm a pretty private person anyway. Very few people know a lot about me or know what's going on in my life. So um, now I'm very open to to sharing those things with people. Well, I'm glad you are, That's and I'm great. glad that you're comfortable. And you know, Me I too. think everybody has their own 
challenges in life with, you know, however that may be. And I, I really feel bad for kids that are growing up these days because they have social media they're trying to 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 mess, you know, to compete with. And people that post things, they're trying to compete with this image in different ways. And I, I like you, I'm sure it just, it's nice to not have been raised during social media times, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all of us, I say, I, we're so happy. I mean, I'm like, I don't know what I would have done if I had social media in high school. Like, I don't know where I would have been in a place mentally or anything yeah. because we didn't have that, you know, well, that was the advantage. Uh, for me, you know, the logic sometimes with Christianity, there's always a big, you know, argument about that. Um, and the way I see it is if God is trying to reach everybody and he wants to bring everyone through God, there's use for all of us. Yeah. Like, I thought he didn't make how is a straight person going to get a gay person to go to God telling them that you're going to hell if you don't do it? But right. I go to him and say, hey, this is how he's changed my life. Look at all these turmoils and all these problems I went through and look where I came because I had faith. That's a much better sell. So mm -hmm. it's hard for me to logically get on that train of thought with people. Um, I thought if, he didn't make any mistakes. Yeah, if he didn't <laughs> make no mistakes. Saying. And I'm telling you, mistakes. this wasn't a choice for me. I didn't, mm -hmm. I was born this way. I have mm -hmm. never went through the the whole, oh, I'm going to have a boyfriend to make somebody happy or anything like that. I've never done that. So um, this is this is what what I was and what I how I was born. It's not a a sexual deviance or anything like that. My relationship's not based on sex. It's based on uh, a comfort level and someone that's there for me that understands the things that I went through. And it doesn't matter. It's a girl. It just happens to be a girl. So I, mean, I just feel like that's just like a one of another small piece of who you are. Yeah, just the small, the, the, the smallest of pieces. You know what I mean? Small piece of. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let, let's get into some of the meat of, of what's going on. So after mm -hmm. you left uh, college and you got into the ABO, which is the American Basketball League, which is, of course, has folded since. But, um, you know, you started there and you were the rookie of the year. And mm -hmm. it was the call. I don't remember the Colorado explosion explosion. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience within the ABL and as we transition to the WNBA discussion, kind of like what the differences and changes that you saw between mm -hmm. the leagues. Well, the ABL was a was really at that time a players league. Um, we didn't have a big TV deal. We had some spots from BET. We had some of the some really great players in that league. Um, and I was almost, I was drafted in the eighth round of that league. Like probably eighth or ninth from the last pick. And I went to an NAI school and the coach told me, you know, you were a superstar at the NAI level, but these girls are another level and you just really might not get to play. And I hope you're okay with that. And I said, if you can put somebody on that court better than me, I'll be the biggest cheerleader. Like, you won't have no problems for me. I, I like to win, baby. So I ended up averaging 20 points and 10 rebounds that year wow. and getting rookie of the year. Just yeah. That's just how I'm built. You tell me I can't do something, I'm going to find a way to do it, or I'll get really, really close to doing it. So, you Excellent. know, um, the ABL was a great experience for me. It definitely primed me and got me ready for the WNBA. And then you went I from basically most of your life in Oklahoma, or ba you know, <laughs> and then moving to, and then being in Colorado, like that has to be some of the biggest change too. And just demographics and location and weather everything like I, I, well that was much closer than new york city i tell you honestly yeah. to tell you the truth when new york drafted me i was the sixth overall pick mm -hmm. when they drafted me i was cussed at the tv like damn i'm going to new york <laughs> because i'm from a town where i grew up at this is population 400 straight yeah. town oklahoma so i wasn't prepared but fell in love with new york and I some love of the new teammates and the toughness and I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm I'm a definitely a proud living alum. Yeah. Well, and then mm. you go on a team with other great names. I mean, yeah. some of the biggest names that started in the WNBA, we were playing with within the Liberty as well. And you guys went to three championship appearances. Like that has to say something in itself, along with just, you know, you being part of a great organization. But what is it that you felt with the NBA, like the WNBA, how did that, you know, what was the, how was the family, the camaraderie? I mean, traveling, that kind of stuff. Well, um, we had great, we had a really good family camaraderie. Uh, Teaspoon was a great leader for our team. Um, Becky Hammond, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Such an unbelievably great story. She did, wasn't drafted, came into the league, and just look where she's at now. She's had a great career. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you came to play us, you came to fight. Yeah, we, you might not, we might not beat you, but we probably beat you up. Like everybody hated. We were the rough and tumble. We kind of paralleled the New York Knicks at the time. Yeah. They had yeah. Latrell Sprewell and those guys, and we grinded out hard defensively, and you know just had a a, a really good team atmosphere. Example: We had a, a teammate that was from Africa that came. She had nothing. Literally, she had three or four things. Mm -hmm. For the first week of training camp, like me and Teaspoon and VJ put our money, our, our uh, per diem together, and we took her to buy clothes. Mm -hmm. But that's how we looked out for each other. If you hit one of us on the court and hurt one of us, we didn't have to get you back. Our teammates got you back. And if one of our teammates didn't get you back, then we had something go on in the locker room about it. But it was just a really, really good. I learned so much from those guys uh, that, that made me – they taught me how to be a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. VJ and uh, Teresa Weatherspoon did. Yeah, man, yeah. great, great times. And so then after the Liberty, I think you had a little bit of a stint over with Washington and the Mystics. Yeah, I uh, Richie Adubato, I'm a system player. I'm a perfectionist. I'm like, I think, third or fourth in the league in efficiency overall in the league. Um, I didn't make a lot of mistakes. I was a system player. I fit Richie's system. When he got fired, I followed him. I'll never be successful in a free system the way you just go score points. I'm a thinker. I think people. So I went with him. Uh, it, it didn't sit well with Carroll. And uh, that's how I ended up in New York and Washington. I played uh, a season. Uh, my knees were hurting that year. Literally, I was in the bed one night. My granddad sat down beside me. He's been dead since I was eight years old. Rubbed me on the head and said, if you don't stop playing. You're not going to be able to walk when you're 50. I woke up and retired the next day. I've had two total knee replacements on one mm. knee. I need one on the other one. Wow. And uh, probably stopped just in time to actually be able to, to walk. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Whoo. And then you kind of, and then you kind of touched on your book a little bit that you got, then you got into your kind of coaching. I know you yes. took some time off. You went into, uh, was with your mom um and kind of chose mom over the game which was absolutely commendable as well and then you kind of got into this coaching thing and how kind of coaching became almost like you're calling it for a second time like what is it about coaching and you know you've coached all levels young girls high school you know college and then into the WNBA and assisting so it's like what 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 about coaching is really I guess resonated with you and been a passion well, probably the most impactful people in my life have been my coaches. And that's what I wanted to be able to give back. And I'm so fortunate to be able to say that I got to do exactly what I wanted to do. Very few people grow up and say, at a, as a 10-year-old, I want to be a coach or a firefighter. And they actually, life happens and sometimes you don't get there. Um, mm -hmm. I got to do everything that I wanted to do. And coaching was one of those, to be able to impact lives and leave legacies with other people. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Talk about your stint, too, when you got into the professional level, because you coached with WNBA for a while with the Dallas Wings, um, a team that I kind of play against on my NBA 2K. Just so okay. You know. I play my aces, though. But I was okay. playing last week while you were the assistant coach on that game, you know what I mean? I was trying to take them on. Talk about your experiences, though, as far as being in that end of the spectrum of coaching in a professional level and how uh, because there were so many different things that happened like the travel was bad for the women like they were flying commercial um there were instances on the pay all of these things um and now that we have a great uh commissioner kathy engelberg yeah. uh like atlanta fever they lost part of partial ownership on uh her being racist let's just say it um what were your experiences as far as being in the WNBA, that coaching environment before all that time, but the things that would happen, like those instances of pay and travel and yeah. that kind of thing. Well, we were just happy to have a league. You know, now girls really have a voice to really go after those things uh, back then. But um, it would I, I've gotten to the point now for me to where I don't really even like to talk about the differences. Like, honestly, to tell you the truth, we can talk about them all day long and we can complain till we're blue in the face but when it, for me what it really boils down to is you can turn on any 
game in the country. Hockey, basketball, baseball, half of the people in those stands are women. That's the difference in mm -hmm. catching us up. Mm -hmm. You will go to a men's game, but you will not come to a women's game. Those are the people I feel like we have to go and get. And if we truly say we want to change the dynamics of women in the world, it starts with us supporting each other and quit begging men to level us up. We have the consumer dollars. We have the smarts. We have everything to level ourselves up. But it's about getting out of our own way. Like, go to a WNB game. I don't care if you don't want to watch women play basketball. Sit there. Spend your dollars there. Bring your kids. It's a great atmosphere. Yes. To me, that's where we have to go and where the talks have to start to be guided. Because it, mm -hmm. for me, I'm just tired of appealing to the 25 to 30, 40 year old range of men. Like they don't like basketball. Half of them do. Half of them don't. But that's their. Yeah. That's but yeah. why keep holding them accountable? It's time to start holding women accountable right. for our own growth. And that, right. for me, that's where it starts. So You're right. lots of people might not like to hear me say that. But for me, that's where where it starts. So talking about that's how they had to start. We didn't have good travel. We didn't get paid well. We had bad trainers. Uh, I want to say bad trainers. The training has just so much more advanced now than it was then that mm -hmm. people done what they knew to do and they did their jobs, but everybody starts somewhere. So mm -hmm. to complain about it's old news now to me, what are we going to do about it? That's yeah. where I'm at now. Facts. So. Well, one of my issues that I've always wondered is, I mean, you know, we all know the NBA has many sponsorships and partnerships. I just never understood why, because it is a women's league, there isn't a lot more women products that are trying to help and endorse the WNBA as well and show that support. Like you've got women and we are like the number one retail buyer of everything. And there's so many <laughs> items that are pertaining to women. Why aren't these companies coming to help out and sponsor these teams? Or to because they're completely driven by men. Uh, because of that's men's it. CEOs in those <laughs> positions. We don't that's have women one, CEOs in those. I the agree. That's CEOs one that thing. The women CEOs that we do have is where we have to go. But also, too, are we doing our part? Are we asking? When that weight room was put up, you yeah. saw how many corporations came and just offered stuff. Right. Yeah. So why aren't we talking to them corporations in the first place? Like, right. and I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not a business person. Like, um, but I don't understand. I'm, I would just like more information because knock on some doors. I'm going to get told no a million times. If I, if I knock on 5,000 doors, I might get a thousand yeses. But if I knock mm -hmm. on a hundred doors, I can get a hundred no's and I give up. To me, that's the same thing about life. We all hit barriers where we stop. What do we do? Do we keep going or do we make a new plan and try to find a way around it or over it? We've tried this way for 25 years. Now let's appeal to women. Like, come on, come to the table. And it ain't just, and it's, it's significant, not just in sports. Who cares about the salaries? The overall thing is women are fighting for women now. Mm -hmm. And once we level that playing field, our voices get a lot stronger. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think I'm hoping because we had such a great March Madness for women and the women's basketball scene. And, you know, some of these games that I watched for the women's NCAA tournament were better than I'd seen before. And I was just so I was so into the games that I can't wait to see some of these players move in and get their chance to play in the WNBA. But I guess one of my questions for you is where do you see when do you think there might be a chance of there being able to be an expansion? Because I had written down is that we've got players like Sue Bird, who I don't want to see Sue Bird leave at all. Like she's still phenomenal. She's 40. But the longer that some of these women are playing in the league and they should play as long as they can, you're, they're leaving less spots open for some of these great girls that are coming up too. And with only X amount of teams, you don't have the space for them and you want to right. keep these great legends still playing that can. So like, where, where's the, you know, where's, the, where's the middle part here? Where's the oh, middle Oh, sweet, nice person. <laughs> now, that's the competitive nature of pro sports. Yeah. If a good kid is coming in, like the kid from UConn, who could quite possibly be the best player in female basketball all around if she's yeah, coming yeah. in yeah she's being and you're a third year player you better be on top of your game right. you better be working and you get your Take job taken spot. it's just it's dog eat dog so right. you i don't think you look at the sue birds and think they should retire because these people no, are no. carrying the league forward sue bird is a big voice 
And Seattle has done a phenomenal job of creating that platform for Sue. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we need people like her to stay because she has the intelligence to fight for the things that need to be fought for because she don't just see money. The people who's going to have problems is the third year, the fourth year, the second year players who's on the bubble, who yeah. if you're a third year player and you haven't panned out, this is why assistant coaches like me are important because I tell players the truth. If you're in your third year going in your fourth year and you're averaging four points a game and you're not doing nothing, they're probably about to draft somebody that they're going to start trying to make better because they've given you four years to develop. Yeah. So while you're sitting on the bench whining and complaining about not getting to play, when your time comes, you better be ready. Yeah. And I so. noticed that within the WNBA, we get a lot of changes within the league. Mm -hmm. Even during regular season, you'll have one guard that's on the team and then they're gone and then yeah. they fish for another. So to your point, I see why that logic makes sense now because yeah. of the fact that you, you, like you said, it's highly competitive and they got to try to get that spot, you know, yeah. either going to take it or, you know, take it. Um, yeah. And to answer your it. question, expansions come into the league and i mean i'm not i'm not the league source but i know <laughs> golden state is interested in a team i know mm. vancouver's right. interested interested nice. in a team so expansions coming i think great things are happening for the league now it's about and then people keep talking about the differences in salaries the men get it took them 50 years to build that fan base it can't be any expansion in salary until there's fans to pay the salaries like Right. Well, you can't get blood from a turnip or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. so they have to have the money to actually be able to pay the people. So for me, it's in the marketing, like Dallas, for example, the Dallas Metroplex area, the whole Dallas don't doesn't, know, doesn't even know the Dallas wings exist. How can you sell tickets? Right. No, we're in Arlington and I can go to Plano and half the people in Plano doesn't even know the team in Arlington there. So they're grassroots marketing, which is the cheapest form of marketing is not very good. So right. for me, that's what it has to be. It has to be an awareness and it has to be a huge a campaign. But, you know, like I said, if I was uh, it would be all life would be crazy if, I, if it was just that simple. I'm sure there's lots yeah. of outside things yeah. that I don't have the information to. And I, it sounds simple to me, but. I'm glad I'm not the person that's on the other. We're all, the we're decision. all wondering. But I'm for the, I'm for yeah. the, 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 the talk of the solution and yeah. the foundation of what needs to happen. And there are people in this city of Las Vegas that don't know we have a WNBA team. Still let's don't. Be clear. Still, Still don't. don't like, know. Huh? So let's be clear. So I, I get what you're saying with that whole thing with Dallas. And it starts with West women to kind of push for that. And I think now uh, with Mel and I having the platform that we have a girl chat sports, we need to do better as far as making sure that our women are all on the same page as far as pushing that goal to have um, more attendance to these games and to support women's sports as a whole, you know, and um, we got a question for, the for you. For guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got a question for you. If you can beat your brother-in-law in basketball. He's never beat me in, at anything, actually. Uh, <laughs> he's he's about six foot four, six foot five, three, two, forty. He can't beat me though. No. <laughs> no, huh? he can't beat me. I feel like no one can beat you, Crystal. I don't even want to take you. Well, he I might be able to beat me now because I'm handicapped. No, uh, <laughs> that's about the only reason. With the knees, I think I, I still don't think we can battle you with the no. knees. I know no one can because you were an excellent shooter on top of everything. So yeah, I know but that. I, I definitely wasn't the best. I'm a realist. I was I was an expert shooter. I was very good at that. I didn't make mistakes, but was I Diana Taurasi? No. Was I some of these great players, Enrique Agumbawale? No. But I was that key player that made all of the big decisions in all of the crunch time moments, and I'll take that. So okay. You made it all work. Mm -hmm. You brought it yes. all together. So, yeah. <laughs> Girl Chat Sports, you guys, um, this is like the extension of Girl Power. We've got yes. uh, Crystal Robinson in the building, and we want to <laughs> shout out our sponsors again of One Hope Wine. Yes. Uh, thank you so much um, again for your sponsorship for this month. Make sure you check them out on www.onehope. Um, Oops. Mail yep. posted it. Yeah, onehopewine.com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm enjoying this and I know our time is coming to an end. Um, we got a little there, bit left, but I wanted to yeah. just talk about the book because I know it gets released on the 27th on Amazon. Yes. I know when we, when we post this, we'll make sure the link is in there, but people can go and pre order now, correct? Yes, they can go pre-order and uh, pre-order the book if you can. It would be awesome because 
you know, if you know anything about the book industry, that's how you get on list. Um, the more pre-orders I get, the better it is. So um, pre-order the book. It will not disappoint. And anybody in Oklahoma knows me, knows that if you buy that book and you reach out to me, I'll probably will go out of my way to meet you to sign it somewhere. Well, I'm going to need oh, you to come to Vegas and sign yes, our copy. Oh, you know I'm coming to Vegas. <laughs> Crystal, please. Yes, I'm, I would love to. I'm so you. excited to be a regular fan this year. Like, I'm going to try hard not to embarrass myself and be a bad fan, but I'm so excited to be able to sit courtside and cheer for some of my friends and, yes. and also make fun of and pick at some of them. So I'm really excited. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Is there mm -hmm. any futures of writing, any other future writings that you have that you might uh, put out after this book? Well, um, this book really covers my childhood up to when I really started playing pro. And my I didn't my adulthood has not been in there that much because it's been ongoing and developing. And I'm sure that there will be most people that read the book and you guys read it. You probably have a lot of what happens. Like, yes. what is she doing now? So. That's what I wrote the book in that way. So there would be a se sequel to it. And my adult life has been pretty exciting. So, yeah. If, if, I I could just you, if I could just give you like an idea, you could, you're welcome to have more like a, almost like a jackass or some kind of video or something about all of your <laughs> adrenaline, the adrenaline, adrenaline junkie stuff that you crazy. were doing. Yeah. My goodness. The surfing I can't... on the truck, the, ditch, yeah. the train, the Russian roulette already took me out. Like I was like, you literally were playing Russian roulette. Like you really were playing that game. Guys, when you live in uh, rural America and there's absolutely nothing to like, we can't go play golf or the top. We can't go. We just got a Chili's like two or three years ago. The big Oh store in my town is Walmart. There's two stop signs. Kids, that. we wow. end up in pastors tipping cows or doing something like that. It ain't tipping normal cows. stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, good stuff. even get like a book on just the adrenaline. I mean, I think that just a whole book on just all the different things that you've experienced with your adrenaline junkie. I, I put it in quotes because I just titled it that. But I mean, I think that is just good reading. Like it's some of the things that you were doing, I was like, no way. And then you're still here. Like you're here right. talking about it. There wasn't like crazy broken bones or anything after the right. fact. I'm just like, wow. That's you how you know I have a calling. God kept his yes, hand on yes, me because of, it, it's so funny because my friends and probably my players, they were like, dang, you got a lot of crazy stories. Like, I really do have a lot of crazy stories, but it was really fun to be able to tell them. And I really hope and I tried hard to tell them in a way that people could feel them and relate to them. Yeah, well, so, you did that. You did that. Well, thank and, you. And um, I, like I said, everybody, please, please check out Crystal's book. It is amazing. I plan on buying a hard copy because when you come to Vegas, I want you to sign it. I will definitely too. sign it. And yeah. uh, and um, I'll probably get a couple copies. So I need you to sign it for the fans. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. No plug. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we so appreciate you coming on. And I mean, like I said, you're the epitome of girl power. You're the epitome of perseverance. And you're also the epitome of all is not lost when you're down, that you can always pick yourself up. Um, through all things. And so I just salute you. I just think this is an amazing time. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you, ladies, for having me. And I look no, forward to seeing yeah. you guys. Yes, please a game. Keep out, reach and contact. Crystal, where can people find you? I don't know. I know you had like a, the Crystal Robbins uh, Facebook or wherever you want yeah. to direct some traffic so that you can get um, you know, people to contact you in regards to maybe they, if you are in their city and they can get their book signed or whatnot. Okay. I, you can reach me at uh, Crystal Robinson. That's on Facebook. It's CRobber3 on Instagram. I don't tweet because I figure I'd probably be kind of like y'all's ex-president. So <laughs> I stay away from Twitter. Um, but those are the two places that that you can get me uh, on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I probably... I, I real interact. I have always, I didn't just start doing this. If you go through my Facebook posts, I interact with people. Most of the fans know I spent my career being close to the fans. And that way, when they saw me, they didn't bother me. It was like, oh, that's just Crystal. We talked to her all the time. I love so. it. That was yeah, so good. It. it was so good having you. We wish Thank you, you guys. The best of luck. Thank you so we much. Wish you all Enjoyed the success you. with the book. And we definitely will catch up with you again in person, hopefully soon, if not shortly yes. after. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much, Crystal. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> and what thanks an everybody time. for watching. I yes. mean, it was so amazing. And I just love all the stories. And so We'll try and get into some sports next week, you guys, or maybe not. We've got another great guest coming on next week. So um, just make sure to stay tuned. We're all about 
keeping the woman empowerment going. And we really want to thank Crystal, of course. And of course, the sponsor, One Hope Wine with yep. Siberian Moore. Um, Mo, how's your wine anyway? My wine's excellent. I'm always a good cab girl. I don't drink many Moscatos because of the sugar. I'm a but sweet. I like a cab. Sweet, I like yeah. a cab, a nice cab. It's a nice, mm -hmm. you know, good thing. I like it with my steaks and that kind of thing. And when you get into winter, I always go a little dark. I do like, um, you know, uh, a nice Riesling or I'll do okay. like, um, in my wife. I can bottles, do a Riesling do a if possible, but if there's a Moscato on the list and I'm going to yeah. have a, a drink, mm -hmm. I'll do it for sure. Yeah. Um, but How's if you yours? do, I, Mine is good. I, I really like it. Um, yeah, and I'm excited. And, you know, you guys go on, I think our Instagram, we posted about it. If you swipe over on the Instagram, there's actually like a little um, video. They have so many gorgeous, and some of the bottles are just beautiful. I love the packaging on the bottles. And the fact that they are also one that gives back. I mean, they've literally donated yes. over $6 million across the country and the world to various yes. charities. So I find that just highly amazing with One Hope and the message rings loud and clear and they're based out of California. I mean, that Napa community and for them to do this for us, I think that's just incredible. Has a great bouquet. I opened the bottle, I let the bottle breathe a little bit before I poured it in my glass. And um, it, it's it's good. It's it's a really good wine. I, I I recommend it highly to everyone. Wonderful. Well, yeah, yeah, you guys, we had a great show. I just, when I read, you have to buy the book. On you Amazon, do. I'm gonna post it in the comments. I'm gonna post it when we post the um the the podcast. If you just tuned in now and missed all of it, feel free to just wait and rewatch it on Facebook. You can also go to Girl to Chat YouTube Sports channel. and to our YouTube channel at Girl Chat Sports, all one yes. word. Subscribe, rewatch it. It'll get posted shortly in a couple hours. Um, go on our link tree, linktree.com slash girl chat sports. You can find all the links where we're at. Shout out to 24-7 AM Radio Network yes. um, for hooking us up with sponsors and for also um, sharing our, our podcast on Tuesday nights there as well while it's live tonight. Shout out to all of people that have tuned in and shared their comments. And, and um, we really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for watching. You. We really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. You we thank you and we will see, we'll you, see you next Wednesday. Next Another Wednesday. wine Wednesday. We'll talk about <laughs> some wine and talk about with our special guest. And yes. you guys tap in. Be sure all to right. tell your friends. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.